So welcome to the Safe Starches panel. Yeah, clap, claps. Been a good thing. <laughs> My name is Jimmy Moore, and if you've never heard, who all in here has never heard of the Live in La Vida Low Carb Show podcast? Hallelujah. <laughs> That's where they're coming from. Thank you, guys. So I've been doing that show for a while. I've interviewed all these guys. Heck, I've interviewed almost everybody who's spoken so far. Um, it's such an honor to do that show, so thank you for allowing me to do that and listening to it and giving your feedback. But I also blog, and uh, uh, it's at the Live in La Vida Low Carb blog, figure that. Um, and about a year ago, it was right after the Ancestral Health Symposium at UCLA, uh, I heard this concept that I had never really heard before in my low carb world, okay? And it was this whole idea of safe starches. I was like, what the heck is safe about starch? I've always heard it raises your blood sugar level and it leads to all these conditions in your health that you don't want, okay? So being the inquisitive mind that I am, I wrote a blog post called, Is There Any Such Thing as Safe Starches on a Low Carb Diet? Because I've interviewed this man, uh, Paul Jaminé, on my show, and he talked about how his plan, the Perfect Health Diet, which we'll be talking about today, uh, is a low carb diet. And I was thinking, okay, starch, low carb, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> it just didn't make sense to me. So I wanted to find out what the real deal was. So I put the question out there and I asked all these people in the community, what you think? So I got all these responses and man, you should have heard. You would have thought I called somebody's grandmama a bad name the way I got some people in the paleo community who didn't like that I even asked the question. But I think if we don't ask those kinds of questions, there's no way at all that those people out there are ever gonna listen to us. So we have to ask these hard questions just so we have understanding. And hopefully today with this prestigious panel, you know, we'll bring a, a little more un understanding to what this issue is really all about. So first up, let's start with the man himself who kind of coined this term. Uh, you know him, Paul Jaminet, perfecthealthdiet.com is his website, and of course his book, Perfect Health Diet. And uh, he's been doing a lot of great work. I, I admire this man. I think the work that he's doing um, is making us think. And if we stop thinking, we stop progressing. Okay? So, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where you came up with this idea of safe starch. Just, let's start with a definition before we move forward. Um, how would you define what safe starches is? And we're trying to keep this kind of moving, so it's going to be like two to three minute answers. Okay. Well, I, basically carb sources are starches and sugars, and uh, the plants would the largest number of starches are mostly grains and legumes. Also, tubers have uh, a fair amount. And many of these plants are very rich in toxins, um, especially the grains and legumes. And, uh, you know, so much of the health benefits that come from adopting paleo ancestral diets comes from giving up uh, those toxin-rich uh, plant foods like, like wheat uh, or soybeans. And uh, so, we coined the phrase, my wife and I coined the phrase safe starches to distinguish uh, starchy plants uh, whose toxins are destroyed during cooking uh, so that they're relatively toxin free when you eat them uh, as against uh, starchy plants that uh, are still toxin rich even after cooking and, and therefore are, are dangerous. Um, and so we believe based on literature, literature search that uh, among the grains, white rice, uh, is toxin free after cooking and so we consider that a safe starch. Um, other safe starches include taro, uh, white potato, sweet potato, uh, and some others. Now including them in a safe starches doesn't mean they're totally free of toxins uh, and we know that uh, potatoes may have uh, toxins like uh, solanine and uh, sweet potatoes have oxalate. Some people will be sensitive to those. Uh, poor handling can produce toxins, but, it, but in general, with good handling, uh, good preparation, most people uh, will not have uh, negative effects from eating these because of the, the toxins. Thank you. So just for kicks, I decided to look up the word safe 
in Webster's Medical Dictionary. It says, not causing harm or injury, especially having a low incidence of adverse reactions <coughs> and significant side effects when adequate instructions for use are given and having a low potential for harm under conditions of widespread availability. Interesting. So the next uh, speaker is Chris Kresser, who, anybody here not know who Chris Kresser is? I mean, really. Uh, he does great work here in the paleo community and we're very honored to have him here at, at this Ancestral Health Symposium. ChrisKresser.com is his website. But Chris, um, as a practitioner, I know you have uh, talked about on your podcast and you've written about on your blog many people who seem to experience problems when they're not adding these safe starches to their diet. Do you know what's going on there? Is, is there any kind of explanation as to what's happening? Uh, yeah, I think it, it, just in terms of symptoms, I'd say the most common symptoms that I see in people who've uh, been on a low-carb diet over a long period of time, and I don't mean to suggest this is everybody, you know, this is a, a subsection of people who've been on a VLC diet for a long time. The main ones would be low energy, uh, cold hands and feet, anxiety, depression, sleep difficulties, mood instability, poor exercise tolerance, and poor uh, exercise recovery. And for those of you who are familiar or who have hypothyroidism or familiar with thyroid disorders, you'll recognize probably many of these symptoms here. And one of the issues is that uh, insulin activates the enzyme that's involved in the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the most active form of thyroid hormone. So on a very low carbohydrate diet with very low levels of insulin, um, people will not convert as much T4 into the active form of thyroid hormone. And this is pretty well documented in the scientific literature. Uh, we know that both calorie restriction and carbohydrate restriction and fasting all decrease the conversion of T4 to T3 and they increase the conversion of T4 into something called uh, reverse T3, which is an inactive form of thyroid hormone that's kind of like a metabolic dead end. Once it gets converted into reverse T3, it, it can't get converted back into active T3. So I think uh, effects on thyroid physiology may be one part of it. Um, there's some other aspects of it that we probably don't fully understand, but it's definitely clear to me as a clinician that not everybody thrives over the long term on a, on a very low carbohydrate diet. And in fact, I would say a substantial number of people that come to me are people that have been having trouble on a very low carb paleo type of diet. And uh, one of the first things I'll do is experiment with adding a little bit of starch and carbohydrate back into their diet, and oftentimes that, that tends to solve the problem. Um, my kind of general stance on this is that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Many of you who know my work have heard me say that before. I think carbohydrate consumption will depend on genetic and epigenetic factors, which Chris Masterjohn just alluded to earlier uh, in, in his discussion on amylase. I think it will depend on existing health conditions. For example, if someone has glucose intolerance or if somebody has uh, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, the, that is a condition where they would be, the, the bacteria in the small intestine, which shouldn't be there in the first place, uh, will be able to, to uh, ferment the starches and that can cause gas and bloating and, and digestive difficulties. And some therapeutic approaches like the GAPS diet remove starches for that reason. And then volume and intensity of activity would be a third factor that would determine the appropriate carbohydrate consumption, including starch. So I think uh, as a clinician, my perspective is that it's, uh, I, I try to avoid kind of making general rules that would apply to everyone because even though we share a lot in common, uh, we're also quite distinct as individuals. Right, good point. Well, the next speaker is Dr. Kate Shanahan, uh, drkate.com. She's got two books, Deep Nutrition and Food Rules. Definitely check those out. They're really good. She's a board-certified family physician. And uh, Kate, you have been doing a survey of low-carb dieters over the past couple of months, um, kind of looking at what Chris was just talking about, some of these issues that, that long-term low-carb dieters are having and that perhaps starch would be the answer for them. Do you have any findings or any comments you want to make about how that's gone? Yes, thank you for asking. So um, I actually had been, I'm a low carb uh, physician because um, it seems to really work for a lot of metabolic problems, weight loss, et cetera. And uh, my patients had actually not run into any of these problems, but when I heard that some people were feeling 
terrible after doing low carb for a while um, and then adding carbs back, I became concerned on two levels. One was I didn't want to be making feel, people feel worse with my advice. And two was if by adding back carbs, I mean, you could say, so what? They add back carbs and they feel better. They've solved their problem, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe they're just feeding into a vicious cycle, uh, you know, and their symptoms going away is continuing the progression of a different problem. So the, the, I, the, what I did was I, um, first I analyzed what I was doing different, um, and that is that when I have my patients adapt a low-carb diet, I have them do it gradually. And so I don't know if this is an answer, but I know that my patients who did this did not run into trouble. So um, they adapt a diet over a period of uh, two weeks per meal, more or less. Somewhere, sometimes it's, it's four weeks because they, they do it with each subsequent visit so they don't get to see me again for a full month. Um, and I hadn't had people run into trouble even with what uh, Dr. Atkins described as the low carb flu. Um, if uh, people are familiar with low carbing, often when you go from having a standard American diet and you drastically drop your carbs, uh, you feel terrible for a while because you're basically you had a higher sugar level set point somewhere you know above the normal range, above 100, maybe 150. And in dropping it down, you're suddenly depriving your body of all this ready glucose and you're going to feel bad for a while, some people. And some people don't even have the low carb flu and they're fine. So that, that aspect of putting it on gradually seemed to avoid the low carb flu pretty successfully. Um, but then I wondered, you know, since I hadn't had people uh, come back with complaints, I, I, w I wondered what else could be the difference. So I uh, put out a little contest and got about 76 different stories. And uh, what I found that those had in common who uh, had problems with the low carbing for a long time had been doing very low carb consistently, often for, you know, at least six months and over a year in many cases. and. Um, very low carb, meaning like under 20 grams, which is the induction phase of Atkins, which Atkins himself, I think, was wise maybe in, in not saying you need to continue this level of carb restriction indefinitely, indefinitely. And what I had also done with my patients was I, I, was, I like variety in diets, and so I thought it was important to allow them up to 70 grams of carbs a day. So while it's important for uh, us to spend some time in ketosis, many days, this is my belief. Uh, some days I think it's important for us to actually be uh, not burning fat, which is the state of ketosis, but burning sugar. And not only that, perhaps having so much excess sugar that we're able to store it as fat. Uh, because you know we know the low carb diet is much better than the standard American diet, but we don't know how long ketogenesis is good for us, you know, how long, this is not, there's no literature, so little literature on ketogenesis, there's certainly no literature whatsoever on extended periods of ketogenesis, so we simply don't know, and you can imagine that in uh, traditional societies, uh, people would be tied to the seasons, and there would be times of certain, uh, you know, the fruits, delicious, irresistible abundance. So, um, probably past my time. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking of extended periods of ketogenesis, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Ron Rosedale, uh, drrosedale.com is his website, and he's one of the originators of a very high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet. And uh, so Dr. Rosedale, um, hearing the first three speakers, um, you know, they seem to kind of talk about things that run counter to what you believe as a physician and what you've seen over the years. Uh, with the Rosedale diet that you've been recommending your, to your patients. Can you give us your thoughts? Sure. Uh, I started putting people on a very low carbohydrate, high fat, very moderate protein diet over 20 years ago as a means to treat very sick people. I was working in a heart hospital, uh, diabetic clinic, and found and just really thought it was really kind of a no-brainer to me why feed sugar to a diabetic and starches turn to sugar, eliminate them, and amazing things happened. I started documenting uh, many different laboratory values. And yes, I found the thyroid went down, but not TSH. Excuse me, TSH did not go up. So TSH and free T3 went down. There was a purposeful reduction in thyroid. It is not hypothyroidism. So I want everybody to get that concept totally out of your head that when people go on a very low carbohydrate diet, they are not going into hypothyroidism. Centenarians have the same, 
have a lower, have an increase in reverse T3, a lower free T3, and not a higher TSH. It's the high TSH that would indicate hypothyroidism, where your thyroid is going down because it has to. Here, the thyroid is going down because it wants to, and it's part and parcel of a genetic phenotype of maintenance and repair that you see in calorie-restricted animals, where the free T3 also comes down, TSH does not go up, and reverse T3 goes up a little bit as a means to temper the thyroid. And the reason for that is for the same reason when your car works really well and it's tuned properly, it doesn't have to rev as high. And we'll still have greater acceleration and get better mileage, which in this case would extend to longevity. So there's a, a genetic uh, phenotype, there's a genetic pathway that regulates aging in virtually all animals. And it's found that if you can tap into that genetic pathway, really amazing things can happen in reversing all sorts of diseases from uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, osteoporosis, multiple sclerosis, brain disorders. And that's because what you're doing is upregulating maintenance repair. You are getting the same type of benefit that you get in calorie-restricted animals, but without calorie restricting, because all of these pathways were determined long ago when glucose was the primary fuel. Fat didn't exist as a fuel because you have to have oxygen to burn fat and there was no oxygen in the atmosphere when these rules were being laid out. So fat, fat is kind of a, a free fuel with as few detriments as possible. Carbohydrates are either fiber or not fiber and if it's not a fiber it'll turn to sugar and that sugar will cause harm in some way, shape or form. It's just a matter of how much and when. It'll cause glycation, and more importantly than that, it'll raise insulin and leptin. And when you raise insulin and leptin, you are doing lots of really bad things, especially long term, not the least of which is contributing to leptin and insulin resistance, which is a sin qua non of accelerated aging and chronic disease. And we'll get into that hopefully if I have time now or maybe tomorrow when I talk. Thank you, Dr. Rosedale. Now we'll come back to you, Paul. Um, I know when I interviewed you the second time uh, on my podcast, you said you were quite surprised that people were shocked about this whole idea of safe starches being controversial. Um, and I wonder if it's just a PR, um, a, a semantics type of issue, using the word safe. I know uh, Dr. Rosedale and y'all's back and forth, uh, would you call it tolerably harmful instead of safe starch? I, um, no. <laughs> and so. Uh, is, is that the issue? It's just a semantic thing that maybe you're being misunderstood by what you mean when you say safe starch? No, I, I think there are real substantive differences between Ron and I on, on this. Um, I think, you know, he, he, he seems to be treating glucose solely as a toxin, and, you know, so there's only negative effects. Um, I think it's important to recognize that glucose is also a nutrient. And, uh, and it's not necessarily a toxin. Um, we're very much evolved to, to have some glucose. Um, we're very much evolved to have a certain blood glucose level, uh, and either lower or higher blood glucose levels will increase mortality and disease risk. Um, we're evolved to have a certain, to favor a certain carbohydrate intake. Um, so that's clear, for instance, uh, it, 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 it's around a 30% uh, carb diet by calories. If you eat fewer carbs than that, uh, then your body will manufacture glucose from protein in order to uh, introduce more carbs to the body. If you eat substantially more than that, you know, above about 40%, uh, then you'll start converting uh, glucose to fat. Uh, so your body resists uh, having too much carbohydrate. And we can also see uh, from, for instance, the composition of breast milk, uh, that uh, you know, which in all mammals, in, including humans, uh, the composition of breast milk is between 50 to 60 percent fat, uh, between uh, 30 to 39 percent carbohydrate, uh, and between 7 percent and 20 percent protein. Uh, so it's a very clear uh, ranking of fat first, carb second, protein third. Uh, in terms of macronutrient composition. So that's sort of the natural diet, and the body will adapt uh, to different diets. 
And when you eat uh, different, uh, differing amounts of carbs, uh, one of the adaptations is in thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is a regulator of glucose utilization. Uh, when, when you eat a very low carb diet, T3 goes down in order to conserve glucose. So uh, there's less glucose utilization in the body. Um, when people are hyperthyroid, they produce too much thyroid hormone, uh, their bodies utilize more glucose. It's, it's easy to become hypoglycemic if you're hyperthyroid. Um, now, it's true, as Ron says, that that reduction in T3 is not, uh, does not indicate dysfunction of the thyroid gland. Uh, your body is functioning normally. But it's not necessarily optimal for you to be forcing your body to conserve glucose because it's, because it's too scarce. Uh, glucose has important functions in the body. Uh, over half the proteins in the body are glycosylated, meaning they only function properly if, if the amino acids are bonded to glucose or a sugar derived from glucose. Um, and many of those proteins are important for long-term health. Uh, for instance, the primary proteins in tears, saliva, mucus, digestive tract mucus, are predominantly sugar. They have more sugar than amino acids. And, uh, and without those, you'll lose uh, protection against disease. Some of the most common symptoms on very low-carb diets are dry eyes, uh, dry mouth. And, uh, uh, and those will go away very quickly if you eat a little bit of uh, carbohydrate. Um, so, you know, and those are acute symptoms, but there's a risk of long-term symptoms. And we do know in terms of uh, genetic mutations that uh, promote certain diseases, there's a number of genetic mutations which impair the glycosylation of protein, promote cancer, promote diabetes, uh, uh, promote other diseases. And there's some uh, anecdotal evidence from Poland that optimal dieters who uh, that was one of the first popular low-carb diets. Uh, it's been around about 30 years. And, uh, and anecdotally, there have been a, a relatively high uh, number of GI tract cancers uh, among optimal dieters and uh, you know, people dying in their 60s from uh, GI cancers. Um, two of the leaders of the Optimal Diet Society died recently, and one at like 60 and one at 64. And you know, if you're down-regulating mucus, Mucus is defending the uh, intestine against uh, insults, and uh, if you're down-regulating that, it, it could have negative long-term effects. So I, I don't think we really, we, we know there are uh, some acute negative effects from restricting carbohydrate too much, and there's a good chance there are some chronic negative effects too that uh, it'll take probably decades before we can really confirm those scientifically, but uh, uh, the possibility is there. Um, so I think, you know, we have the evolutionary evidence that we do have a natural carb intake that our body wants to get. Uh, and uh, I, I think in terms of the aging literature, it's, it's not that clear which uh, carb intake is optimal for aging. Uh, but I think in general, it's energy excess that, uh, that causes uh, faster aging. And so we should be able to eat a 30% carb diet, which doesn't create a glucose, an excess of glucose in the body, and uh, that shouldn't shorten lifespan. Thank you. Now, Chris, I know you're a big believer in no such thing as a one-size-fits-all approach for anybody. Um, is there any segment of the population where safe starches would actually end up being unsafe for them? Well. I'd be happy to answer that question, Jimmy, but I want to take a step back first. Um, I think there's a real tendency to get caught up in biochemical and mechanistic arguments in discussions like this, and while I don't doubt the importance of looking at those mechanisms, the fact is that there's a lot we still don't understand. And you know, not too long ago, we thought that cholesterol clogged the arteries and that was the cause of heart attacks, and of course, we now know that that's not the case. So. Um, I think we need to clarify the debate, number one. Are we, are we talking about starch being safe for you know, healthy people? Or are we talking about it being safe for people with type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance? To me, those are different discussions. 
Um, number two, if, if we are saying that starch is not safe for healthy people, I think there's little to no human evidence supporting that idea. And there's lots of evidence that opposes it. Um, billions of people around the world are consuming starch safely right now as we speak. And there are several examples of cultures around the world that are, consume a large percentage of calories from starch and are free of obesity and cardiovascular disease and other modern inflammatory diseases. A few examples Chris Master John mentioned earlier uh, in the last presentation are the Kitava in the Pacific Islands who consume 70% of their calories from carbohydrate. Uh, the Okinawans who consume 85% of their calories from carbohydrate and 50% of those come specifically from starch in the form of sweet potatoes and the Tukacenta that get 95% of their calories from starch and they are all lean and fit and free of modern inflammatory disease so if we're going to say that, that starch is unsafe we have to have some way of explaining how these large, these populations, several different populations around in different parts of the world consume a large percentage of calories from starch and, man, and manage to remain free of all of these, these conditions. And then Professor Lieberman, who kicked off the, the discussion, or the, you know, did the first presentation here at this uh, symposium, mentioned the role that starch has played in human evolution, and it, it gave us an alternative to fruit and protein. Um, and Chris Masterjohn showed that humans have more copies of, of salivary amylase genes than non-human primates, and many anthropologists believe that starch played a crucial role in evolution and along with meat may have been responsible for the increase in human brain size. So some would argue that we wouldn't even be sitting here having this debate uh, if it weren't for starch. So. Uh, and then finally, when it comes to evidence about starch or carbohydrate intake decreasing longevity, I don't think there's really any solid evidence for that in humans. Uh, there's some evidence for it in C. elegans, which is roundworm. But roundworms are about a millimeter long, they're transparent, and they're either male or hermaphrodite. So I I'm not really sure we can make those correlations. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence that starch consumption does not affect longevity in humans. I mentioned the Okinawans earlier. Okinawans that were born in 1950 or before consumed a, a diet that consisted, again, of 85% carbohydrate and 50% of that was from sweet potatoes alone. And they have the longest life expectancy at birth that's been measured yet. It's 86 years for men and, and 78, uh, sorry, 86 for women and 78 for men. The, the, their life expectancy at 65 is the longest in the world, uh, 24 years longer for women and 18 and a half uh, for men, for women and 18 and a half years for men. They have the highest number of centenarians in any, uh, any population measured in the world. And once again, if, if starch is, is the toxin, you know, glucose is the toxin um, that Dr. Rosedale would have us believe, it's, it's to me, uh, difficult to reconcile that with some of what we observe in, in the anthropological literature. So perhaps with the caveat that those cultures are able to tolerate the starch a little better because they've grown up in that culture, they weren't exposed to ho-hos, ding-dongs, Doritos, and all the stuff that we have, maybe that means all bets are off? Well, I think it means that it's pretty clear that starch is safe for some people. And it's hard, to me, it's hard to argue against that. I wouldn't argue against the, the idea that some people can't tolerate a lot of starch or glucose because of insulin resistance or, you know, other, other problems, even gen genetic and epigenetic uh, predispositions that don't enable them to process starch as well. But to me, I think we really have to separate these two conversations because otherwise um, we run the risk of you know, throwing out an entire class of foods without really much human evidence to support that. Yeah, I think one of the problems with the whole safe starch thing in my mind is it's an across the board thing for people in their minds. They see, oh, safe starch, that gives me permission to have starch without any caveats at all. I mean, people will see that and go, oh, I guess I can have a white potato, never mind what it's doing to my blood sugar. You know, and those kinds of things. Now, uh, Kate, you said that you didn't really see this a lot with your patients, um, having them on a low-carb diet. Uh, did the low-carb diet that you included, which has 70 grams of carbohydrate, uh, did it include some starch in it, or how did they get to the 70? Well, um, my view is that sugar is sugar, so it doesn't matter whether it comes uh, from fruit or from a banana, you know, something that's starchy, like a potato. Um, so basically, I just want to keep them away from anything processed and have them have their uh, starch, their sugars, 
in the form of whatever it is that is as fresh and healthy as possible. You, get, you even get sugar from cabbage, so um, the, I don't really care. So we just calculated it as, as long as they follow a couple other rules, like that it's not gonna be processed, they're gonna have the right fats. I do include fermentation, which always lowers the starch content of things like cabbage. Uh, anything that is, gets fermented, the, the, uh, the sugar content gets reduced. But I just wanted to briefly um, address something about the Okinawan diet, because I uh, was when I was in Hawaii, many of the folks were from Okinawa, and I I have to th I think that when Americans interpret diets from other countries, we do so with a very biased and jaundiced eye, and. I don't really believe what you, the statistics that that you cited. I'm, you know, I'm sure you have good reason to say what you said, but I don't believe them because the um, the folks who were there said that you know they had their own gardens, they were fishing all the time. Rice is very difficult to grow, and uh, so they didn't grow that much of it. They just they used other vegetables, green vegetables and some fruits. Um, often would have their own chickens, so I don't see that they would have had so much starch um, in their diets. And also, in Hawaii, I didn't see that they were genetically adapted to high starch diets because when they started eating uh, rice for breakfast, rice for lunch, they got diabetes and got overweight just like everyone else. So the longevity data has to be interpreted very carefully because there's so many confounding variables, not the least of which is this epigenetics sort of wild card that we don't really understand the generational influences of uh, you know, the people that now are living to be 90. When they grew up, their world was different. There was no trans fat. They were, everything was practically was organic. So, you know, we are not living to be 90 because I'm, I'm not 90, I'm not even half that. But, um, so I don't know how long I'm gonna live. And so we can't say, you know, that the Okinawans, what we see them doing now is gonna make them live to be 90. Um, so uh, there's, there's just so many confounding variables in any of this. All I can say is when, I, when my patients keep their numbers ten, generally between like a low of 20 and a high of 70, they don't, of grams of carb from any source in the context of what I define as a traditional diet with the diversity of meat products that people used to eat, which also includes some organ meats, some bone broths, a lot of stuff uh, talked about um, at the Weston Price Foundation tables. If you want to go there, they'll give you more information on that. Um, as well as fermented vegetables with the probiotics. So um, it's not just about macronutrients. It's about how we cook our foods. And there's a lot of uh, differences even in uh, just preparing your starchy foods. You can prepare them in ways where they're going to interact with the protein in ways that's going to make that starch not so safe. So. Um, so in my experience in clinic, I say 30 to 70 is good, um, and the range I believe is important, and it, really a traditional diet. Um, it, it, paleo diet is one type, I believe, of a traditional diet. It's a traditional diet from a very long time ago that we don't have a lot of details about, but we do have a lot of details about many other traditional diets, and if you watch TV shows like No Reservations or some of the cooking channel shows, you'll get to see how much diversity people have in these other countries in their diet that we don't have, and I think that's a lot of what's, uh, what's missing from our discussions on, on a healthy diet, is a huge diversity. Thank you. Now, Ron, some in the ancestral community would say, oh, it's not really about what you're talking about with blood sugar. It's just real food. As long as you stick to real food, no matter what those sources of real food are, potatoes, fruit, um, the, it's real food, then you should eat it, and it should be a part of your ancestral diet. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, that goes <laughs> you know, down to the, I think, more basic question. Let, let me try and clear up a little confusion here. When I first started doing this, it was well over 20 years ago when I first proposed a very low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And then it was met with incredible resistance. There were maybe four or five people in the world that believed in a very low carb diet, or even a low carb diet at all at that time, and they were all high protein. So I'm the last person standing because of the high fat. And the reason I got there was because I was looking at commonalities among all life, not differences. Our commonalities are much more important. Those are the things that life cannot live without. So you look at cholesterol. You brought up cholesterol, and, and it's true. You know that there's, uh, and, and I unfortunately have to take some of the blame 
for putting cholesterol on the map, and I won't go into I don't have time to go into that story, but when I was in medical school, it was a huge lawsuit. Anyway, got cholesterol, and I know we were wrong. <laughs> and the reason I knew we were wrong is because cholesterol is part and parcel of all life. You can't live without cholesterol. It's a part of every cell membrane. So how can you say that you want to take it away? You can't have a steroid molecule without cholesterol. You know, it's, it's really important. So it's one of the few commonalities among life. It's not whether it's there or whether it's not. And in fact, life is not even determined by the parts that it is made up of. Life is determined by the instructions given to the parts. So for us, we're 15 trillion cells, and we've got hormones and other signaling molecules that tell those 15 tr trillion cells what to do to act collectively and harmoniously as one for the common good. And all disease will be a disease in communication. So it's communication of what to do with that cholesterol. So if it's not doing the proper things, it can cause harm. I got to the same point in calcium. And I think I was the very first person to warn about the dangers of taking calcium supplementation. Because if you look at somebody who, who has osteoporosis, they invariably have higher levels. There's a direct correlation between calcification in arteries and osteoporosis. You've got the calcium. The body has lost the ability of where to put it. So when you look at all the commonalities, there are certain commonalities that you just cannot get around. And number one, if you eat something that turns to sugar, and I tell you, and anybody who eats rice or starch and you have an intact digestive system, it will turn to glucose. Okay? That glucose will do certain things, and it'll do it in you and you, and it'll do it in a cockroach, it'll do it in a worm, it'll do it in everybody. And some of those things will cause damage. But more importantly, it will raise insulin. And it will raise insulin in a C. elegans. And normally, a C. elegans doesn't eat glucose. Normally, it's on a very low carbohydrate diet. It's actually on a diet very much I recommend. And if you feed that C. elegans a small physiologic amount, concentration-wise, what a human would take on a safe starch diet, you shorten its lifespan. And that was very definitively shown by Cynthia Kenyon after I had a discussion with her to do that experiment. It was very cool. And so there are certain things that will happen throughout life, and those are the things that are most important that you really have to look at. The safe starch diet, I think, you know, and, and I could be wrong, so you can correct me, I think arose because of perceived uh, term of, of, of glucose deficiency. There were, there were symptoms from glucose deficiency, which, by the way, I haven't seen either in somebody who followed my diet properly. I think that if you get symptoms, it's because you're really not following the diet. You can burn two fuels. You can burn sugar, you can burn fat, or you can burn ketones from fat, and that's it. If you're on a diet such as mine, you have to be able to burn fat properly. And if you can't, and you're depriving yourself of carbohydrates, you've got no fuel to burn, and you're going to be in trouble. So if you're going to follow this diet, it has to be done properly. And you have to really go way down on your carbohydrates, and you have to eat a high-fat diet. And do not make the mistake, because it's made all the time, of equating all low-carbohydrate diets as the same. A low-carbohydrate, high-protein diet is extremely different and disadvantageous, I might add, to a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet, which will get very different results. Because the fat can furnish ketones, it can furnish a glycerol that you can use to make glucose, it can, uh, it can furnish all of the nutrients that you need to burn so that you don't have to have any carbohydrates. That's not the same with protein. And so, for instance, bears, when they come out of hibernation, they've measured their ketones, and it's quite low. And it's because they're getting all of their fuel from fat. The brain doesn't need to burn any sugar at all under well-adapted conditions. The deficiency syndrome that people are talking about is because they're not adapted to a high-fat diet. And we talk about kidavans real quickly. Kidavan, I, I totally agree with on the Okinawans. The Okinawans eat a high fish, high vegetable, low starch diet, and they've done definitive studies to show it's a low calorie diet. So they're on a low calorie diet. Their longevity is no surprise. The kidavans is the same thing. They're a small uh, indigenous population that are kind of isolated. They might have all sorts of mutations that might be advantageous. But one of the things we do know is that they're small, literally. The, the, the males average five feet four, women five feet one. Small people and small members of any species live longer, probably because they have low IGF-1. 
Now, IGF-1 is very much associated with longevity. A friend of mine, Andre Barkey, who was president of the American Aging Association, did all sorts of studies to show that aging is very much correlated and even caused by IGF-1. And one more last point. You cannot confuse correlation with cause. That's done all the time. So any population study you're talking about, you're talking about a correlation and not a cause. And as Kate mentioned, there are so many confounding variables, such as was IGF-1 measured? You know, did they really measure everything? Maybe they lived that long despite their diet rather than because of it. And a lot of that could be. So you can take the same population, take the Kidavans, put them on a low carbohydrate diet, I bet they'll live even longer. And who says, by the way, they even live long a time? You know, last I heard, their, their average lifespan was not even long. You know, so I, I, I do not understand this obsession with the Kidavan. <laughs> Thank you. So Paul, um, a lot of people may not realize, but you actually have some ketogenic diets as part of your perfect health diet for specific diseases. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we have a, we have a ketogenic variant of our diet, which, uh, uh, which we have because uh, supplying ketones can, to the brain and the nerves can be therapeutic for certain neurological conditions. Uh, so we've had people on the ketogenic version of our diet that uh, uh, have recovered from lifelong migraines, um, recovered from some mental illnesses like obsessive compulsive disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression. Um, and we had some uh, kids with a genetic disorder called neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation, uh, which is an incredibly painful disorder, they have uh, uh, dystonia, spasms, and they're, they're in intense pain, uh, die in their teens, uh, but you know, the, the last 10 years is extremely painful. And uh, uh, apparently on uh, a ketogenic diet, uh, they don't have the spasms and don't have the pain. Um, uh, so several kids have been, in, have been on our diet for, for several years. But the design of our the ketogenic version of the perfect health diet does include some safe starches. So uh, the ketones are generated by it's sort of flooding the liver with MCT oil, uh, and the liver will export uh, the excess calories as ketones even if you're eating starches. Um, and so you can, you can eat starches, supply your body with the glucose you need for glucose nutrition, um, Ron made the good point about cholesterol, that it's on every cell membrane, it's, you know, but you can say the same thing about glucose. Uh, cells cannot interact unless uh, proteins are glycosylated. So, um, you know, it is important to supply the body with glucose. A lot of the negative effects on clinical ketogenic diets uh, were a result of not, not supplying sufficient carbohydrate and protein. Uh, you know, they would just give them huge amounts of fat and leave them malnourished. And um, you know, so ketogenic diets can be risky if they're badly designed, uh, but they can be helpful. Um, I don't know if, if there's time. I'd like to respond to some of the aging please, please issues. Um, I I sort of have a bit of a, a middle ground in this. There, it's there's not much evidence relating carbohydrates to aging. There is an inverse correlation between carbohydrate intake and lifespan in population studies. So if you go country by country, uh, the higher the carbohydrate intake, the shorter the lifespan as a, as a rule. And this is true even within advanced countries, like the European countries vary from like 47% carbs to 50%, 56% carbs or so. And uh, the, the higher carb intakes have uh, shorter lifespans. But when you look around the globe, you know, every country is between 45% carb and 80% carb. Uh, there aren't population studies with low-carb diets. Uh, my bet would be that uh, the dependence of longevity on carbohydrate intake would have a U-shaped curve, and the longest lifespans would be around uh, probably 30 to 40% carbohydrate, uh, maybe 20, 20 to 40%. Um, and then, I uh, had another point, but I've forgotten what it was, so I'll, I'll pass that. I can finish oh, it for you. I, I remember what it was. All right. <laughs> the other point is, yes, you can, in, in the worms, um, if, you, 
if you deprive them of carbs or if, or if you make genetic changes uh, which uh, reduce insulin signaling, then you will extend their lifespan in the laboratory. You'll extend their maximum lifespan. But if you put those same genetically modified worms into the soil, which is their natural habitat, they'll have a shorter lifespan than wild type worms. So they basically become very fragile uh, to certain insults and threats. And the same thing will happen if you malnourish people on glucose or protein. Um, you know, you may, uh, protein restriction is very effective at extending maximum lifespan, but it also makes you more, more vulnerable to toxins and threats. I believe Chris Masterjohn has done a lot of good blogging about that. And, uh, um, you know, so as a practical matter for your life expectancy, uh, I don't think people should expect it's going to be greater on a very low carb diet. We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, so I want to leave plenty of time for you guys to ask questions because you, you probably don't want any questions about this topic, but uh, I'm just kidding. So we're going to try to leave about 10 minutes for that. So I'm just going to ask whoever's left on the panel has anything else they want to say before I go to that. Chris. Yeah, just a couple of points. Um, in a healthy functioning metabolism, I'm not sure eating glucose and having insulin go up and storing glucose in the cells is a problem. I actually think it's a normal physiological process. And, sh you know, short of insulin resistance, leptin resistance, and other metabolic issues, I don't see that that just strikes me as normal human physiology. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out is even though I do agree that a low-carb diet is often the best choice and starting place for people with metabolic issues it's worth noting that other approaches have also been shown to be effective in the scientific literature so low-fat diets although not as effective as low-carb diets do cause fat loss even without voluntary calorie restriction um, crash diets like calorie restricted diets this 800 calorie diet that some of you might have read about um, that was published uh, earlier this year where diabetes, type 2 diabetes, was almost completely reversed in, in a number of patients and even after they went back on their normal diet for a period of time. And then how many of you have heard of uh, Chris Voigt and the potato diet? Anybody? Show of hands here. So this is a guy who ate nothing but white potatoes for two months. That's it. Only potatoes. He lost 21 pounds. Pardon me? Yeah, so he, he lost uh, 21 pounds, he cut his triglycerides in half, he cut his LDL by 40%, and he, his fasting glucose went down from a, an average of 104 to begin with to 94 after the study uh, period was over. And he had a lot of improvement in other metabolic markers that were measured too. So I'm not suggesting the potato diet is necessarily a, a healthy choice. I don't use it with my patients in the clinic. <laughs> I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who'd be willing to do that, to tell you the truth. But um, I am suggesting that, uh, that, that glucose is, is not, not, not a toxin, certainly for healthy people in, in normal amounts and, and possibly not even for people with metabolic issues. Well, I interviewed Chris Boy on my podcast, and he was miserable eating that every day. Yeah. So, <laughs> not, not very recommended. So, anybody else? Uh, sure. But <laughs> no, you go first. <laughs> I'll Thank take you. everybody's time. <laughs> yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Just real quick, I wanted to say one uh, other. It's part of the non-aging phenomenon. <laughs> Stealing time. <laughs> Um, on my uh, low carb contest, one of the things that I found also in, in those people who had been low carb for a long time and had problems was that they had kind of gotten into a serious rut where they were doing the same thing over and over. And, um, and part of it is just the, the, the lure of convenience, right? It gets easier to do something. Um, and you do it again and again, you know, especially if it made you feel good in the beginning. But um, the, I noticed that there were many people who had just very ultimately restricted diets. And um, I think that uh, one of the things that we can just totally lose sight of this whole, what are we really after when we eat? It's not macronutrients. It's, 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 it's information from the earth. You know, the, the earth uh, has all kinds of chemicals that it produces, and we need lots of them. Um, and so, you know, food is information, and what we want to do is try and get the most diversity of that information 
the same diversity that our ancestors got. And so they expect what our ancestors got. And this is why I think understanding traditional diets, all traditional diets, not just the paleo diet. So if you're Chinese, Japanese, Russian, whatever, and, and you know um, a lot of those kind of recipes, then, then those are going to be good for you. And at and, and some level, you don't need to worry so much about the macronutrient content because you can get some stress just, you know, oh my gosh, am I doing doing this right, am I going to live forever, am I, you know, uh, losing my chances. Enjoy your food, get the information from the earth in as high as quality as you possibly can, and, and that seems to keep people out of all kinds of trouble. Thank you, and Ron, can you do it in a couple minutes? Sure. We'll, we'll go, will you do India time? Uh, first of all, what nobody is saying that glucose is not a nutrient that is necessary. You know, of course, we have desirable uh, glycation. It's part and parcel of many different body parts. That's not the discussion. And the discussion is, do we have to eat it? And so the, the question really in this whole debate boils down to, is it better to eat the glucose or make it via gluconeogenesis? That's really what it boils down to. And that begs the question, what's wrong with gluconeogenesis? Is it bad? And that has to be further elaborated on by, because there's different substrates for gluconeogenesis. The only bad part of gluconeogenesis might be if you have to eat up your own lean mass. Okay, that means if you have to get the glucose from protein. And that's why a long time ago, I started putting people on a low protein diet, not a high protein diet, because I was treating a lot of diabetics and I didn't want them. We know that diabetics make a lot of their glucose when they wake up in the morning from protein, and they lose lean mass. And I found, when I put people on my diet, they actually gained lean mass, almost uniformly, without exercising. So they were not only not burning up their lean mass, they were adding to it because they were becoming, at that time, I thought, more insulin sensitive, and that's proving to be correct. The other substrates for gluconeogenesis, uh, which are ketones and recycled lactate and glycerol, from fat are extremely safe and extremely easy, and there's multiple studies that I don't have time to go into right now that show that they're much healthier for you. Burning ketones is far healthier for you than burning glucose. Uh, it's healthier for nerves. Uh, it's healthier all the way around. And George Cahill from this beautiful university, uh, who's one of the leading experts on starvation physiology, and that's really what we're talking about here. And he mentions himself that when we're talking about starvation, we're talking about carbohydrate starvation. Is there a problem with car carbohydrate starvation? And he says no. He says that under adapted conditions, the brain requires virtually no glucose intake, that it can adapt to burning ketones and the glycerol from fat and blah, blah. You don't need to take it in at all, and in fact, functions much better, which I think you might have even mentioned as far as uh, epilepsy. They're even using it now for, uh, for that sort of thing. So that's something that's you know, really important to, to understand. When we talk about aging, what is really being discovered in aging is that there are pathways, or is a particularly common pathway that seems to be uniform across all life. In other words, it's really ancient. That senses the amount of nutrient availability and adjusts reproduction accordingly. And evolution is for reproductive success. It is not for a long post-reproductive lifespan. So anybody wants to do just what's natural, what you're really saying is that after I've had children and given them enough opportunity to stand on their own two feet, then I'm perfectly fine with dying because that's what natural is. Okay? So get that out of your head. All we have to go by if we want to live a long post-reproductive lifespan is science. What we have to do is use nature's tricks that allowed life to live through reproductive years and carry them on post-reproductively. And the main trick is a genetic pathway that can greatly upregulate maintenance mechanisms such as DNA repair and autophagy and intracellular antioxidants, not extracellular, so that it can outlive a perceived famine. The nutrients that regulate this nutrient availability are insulin, mTOR for protein, insulin for glucose, and probably leptin for fat. And when you keep them all low, and they're kept low by very low carbohydrate, and as low protein as you can get, 
without getting into protein deficiency, you, it is shown that you will upregulate that genetic pathway that will upregulate repair mechanisms that will make you healthier all the way across. We're not just talking about uh, living a, a longer average lifespan. What we're getting at is science is able to greatly extend maximal lifespan. Losing weight is an irrelevant story. Anybody can lose weight. The best thing to lose weight, by the way, is to take cyanide, you know, <laughs> and you'll lose weight. You know, so uh, losing weight and health is not the same thing, so forget that. Um, but what we're after is, is health. And health and living a longer maximal lifespan are totally tied together. I can assure you, if you're unhealthy, you're not going to live a really long life. And so it's these repair mechanisms that we have to tie into. And when you eat glucose, when you eat a safe starch, in every single one of you, I promise, you will raise your insulin. Your glucose might even stay fairly normal but you're doing so at the expense of raising insulin, you are substituting one evil, which is high blood glucose, for another even worse evil called high insulin. And I gave a talk back in, I think, 1993. It was the first talk given on the detriments of high insulin, called What About Insulin? It became quite famous. And it set the stage for everybody who's talking about insul insulin today, and everything I said in that talk is new information today. I talked about the glycemic index. I talked about glycation. I talked about small, dense LDL. I talked about everything 20 years ago. Nothing you're hearing today is, is really new. It's just taking that long for that information to get around. It hasn't changed. So there are some things when you talk about the basics that really don't change. And the things that don't change are the commonalities among all life, not the subtle differences, not the change in the color of our eyes. The way our eyes work are fundamentally the same. And that's what's important to life, and that's what you have to keep in mind. And I can summarize everything there is to know about health and nutrition, and it's this, that your health and longevity will be dependent on the proportion of fat versus sugar that you burn over a lifetime, period. And if you eat starches and if you eat sugar, it shuts off fat burning, and you will be less healthy for it. And there's a lot of science behind what I just said, and I don't have time to go into it now. If I have some time tomorrow when I talk, I'll do it then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. All right, so we have about eight people want to ask questions and four minutes, great. So uh, let's start with you over there. Um, I'm a family physician, so I you know, treat patients and they have to be responsible for outcomes. And I think I agree with Lustig and Johnson that you, you can't just talk about sugars. Um, in, in this country, in this country um, we get a lot of our sugars from fructose, in the form of sucrose, high fructose corn syrup. And there's no ancestral diet that I'm aware of that contain the combination of excessive fructose and high glycemic carbs. That's the American diet. That's what's killing us. It's driving, um, we now think, brain dysfunction, a lot of psychiatric disorders, a lot of metabolic disorders. So, you know, I think if we didn't have excessive fructose, that causes insulin resistance. You could probably consume starches with, with a lot less negative impact. But nobody in this country is free of insulin resistance. That's Maybe right. a few people in this room. We all have diabetes. Well, Pre-diabetes. Well, it depends on what you call diabetes. If you define diabetes by insulin resistance or leptin resistance, yeah, which I do. Yeah, never eat Right. And so you should eat a diet to treat diabetes. Everybody. So there's no such thing as some healthy people and some unhealthy people. We're all unhealthy to a degree. Right. So, I mean, if, if you come from a culture with no excessive fructose, eat potatoes and rice and so forth, you're, you'll probably be okay. Yeah. Nobody in this room qualifies that I know of. Well, that's one aspect, certainly fructose. I talked about fructose a good two decades before Lustig did and, and told about the detriments of fructose. And it's certainly something that's bad. We're talking about life is, is going to be a constant battle between damage and repair. Right. Okay? If we could repair damage as fast as it occurred, we would live forever. Okay. Most people are talking about the damage that's occurring, and we have some control over that damage. Okay. Oxidation causes a lot of damage. I can't tell people to stop breathing. Okay. So oxidation will occur, but we have most control over repair of damage. And that repair of damage I cannot say enough about because it's so important. It's regulated by nutrient sensors that fructose does regulate to some extent. So we have to look at the parts. We have to look at glucose and fructose and cholesterol and everything as to how they affect hormones that regulate the integrity of the relationship among the 15 well, trillion cells. Those things are somewhat complicated. All I know is in managing thousands and thousands of patients, 
If they limit their fructose intake. Pardon me, sir. We're running out. We're actually out of time now. So fructose is bad. I, I agree. It's not the only thing. Thank you very much. And if you want to ask these guys any questions, they'll be up here a few minutes, right? <laughs> they will now. Uh, 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 uh,